Today on the Grave Talks, the ghosts of St. Augustine. St. Augustine is the oldest continually occupied city in the United States. And because of this, you can imagine that St. Augustine's history is very rich. Along with all of the people who have lived and visited St. Augustine throughout its 449 years, many of them have died there. After death, many assume that these spirits should move on. However, if you've ever walked the streets of St. Augustine, you may develop a different opinion on Final Destination. It's safe to say St. Augustine may be one of the most haunted cities in the United States. The downtown streets of St. Augustine are old, narrow, and tightly connected. They lead from one haunted location to the next. With so many haunted locations, it is impossible to cover them all in one episode, but we will do our best. Today on The Grave Talks, the ghosts of St. Augustine. There, there's a lot of history here in St. Augustine itself, uh, without going too in-depth, going all the way back to 1513 uh, when Ponce de Leon first landed here, you know. And then uh, several years later, about 57 years later, in 1565 is when Pedro Mendez came here. And he's the guy that actually founded the city of St. Augustine. And then, of course, all the battles and everything that took place over the, the last 400 and some years, 452 years, uh, there's a lot of history here. And all the tragedy that has taken place here, again, with the diseases, the outbreak of the yellow fever, um, again, the battles and things that's taken place here, uh, makes St. Augustine, well, one of the very, is the very first continuously oldest city in the United States, which also makes it haunted uh, because of everything that's taken place there. So uh, with that said, then up to present day, uh, you know, St. Augustine has always been known, uh, starting with our company, uh, you know, Jonas uh, Berhammer was, uh, Berhammer, I should say, uh, started Ghost Augustine here, the company, and founded it around 2001, and has had it for going for about 17 years now. Um, and over that, he's done a lot of investigating and things like that himself, and had other people working for him. One of the questions I like to ask when we're talking about a location that has such a long and storied history is what is the first account that you're aware of, of ghostly activity, of haunted activity taking place in St. Augustine? Uh, you know, to, to be frank, right up, I've heard a lot of stories working around the, the college and, and like I said, with other historians, my gosh, going all the way back to around the 15, 1600s, uh, people have said that they have seen ghosts uh, throughout the city. Uh, Indians, Spanish soldiers, British soldiers, and things like that. Um, going as far as I was told, as far as that, uh, going back that far to the actual 15, 1600s. Coming back around to more current day, one of the more haunted locations, and it's a very relative thing to say in a city like this, because it, it, it's probably all about perspective, really, but, but a location that I've heard quite a bit about, and I know you've done some investigating at, is, is the British pub and the apartment that, uh, that is, is a part of that building. Can you share anything about that? We have uh, the British pub, we call it. Well, that's what it is. It's the apartment above. And on my particular tour, um, the Ever Dark Express, um, that's one of the places that I do take uh, my guests to. Now, what happened was several years ago, um, dating back to around 2010, as I was told, there was two young men named Mike and Dave that had purchased this place. And they bought it as partners, but they could never get along for obvious reasons. In 2012, there was a heated discussion between them, and uh, Mike went out the back door to kind of cool off from the argument. When he came back in, had a massive heart attack and died at the back door. Uh, 
So therefore, they say that uh, Mike haunted the, the British pub in the upstairs apartment many times. Well, on my tours of investigating, now, here's the thing. I do two different types of investigating. I actually do the tours where I take people in there, and we do a small-scale investigation with the K2 meters and a couple other little toys. I have actually performed 14 uh, total paranormal investigations for the company uh, in the apartment itself. And in the apartment, I would say it's probably, to me, the most scariest place that we have on my tour. Uh, well, I, I hate to sound crazy or anything, but over the last four years that I've been investigating there, uh, we believe, and I know it sounds crazy, we believe that we have some kind of a evil entity that comes through there occasionally. Now, with that said, first, uh, we do have Mike, what we believe is Mike's spirit that comes through. We have a little girl named Sarah that comes through for us. Also, a guy named Kepler and Victoria, and also a small child named uh, Leon or Leo. We're not too sure. But with that said, uh, there's been many a times when we investigate, people say that they see a dark shadowed figure running across the hallway from one room to another. I've had people actually literally get scratched or slapped or their hair pulled in this apartment. So with that said, we have cameras throughout the apartment. And like I said, I've done uh, full-fledged investigations up there. We've caught uh, on EVPs, you know, uh, voice phenomenal, uh, voices from the other side. And a couple of them sounds uh, very deep, dark, and sinister. We've also got a couple of pictures that I've got on my tours uh, that shows an apparition or something that, again, looks very sinister. Uh, myself, personally, it is a, a three-bedroom apartment, living room area, and dining room kitchen. Myself, personally, when I go up there, I uh, walk in the front door, and that's about as far as I go. I uh, uh, pretty much refuse to pass the table and go into the back, into the kitchen area, or the hallway, or, or bedrooms. I've had I've had things happen to me there. Um, I get pressure on my chest. I don't know what it feels like to have a heart attack, and I don't really want to. But I've had a lot of heavy pressure on my chest. I get dizzy. I get nauseated. I get sick. Uh, like I said, I've, I've uh, felt like I've been slapped in the face and get a burning sensation. I get kicked in the back. And uh, I always thought, you know, it might be my mind playing tricks on me, you know. But after doing the investigations and finding out what I have, uh, I've had some long conversations with this spirit. And again, through the equipment that we use, uh, it pretty much said never pass a certain point in the apartment. As long as as long as I don't pass that that threshold. Uh, for the most part, I don't have any trouble. Now, I have other people, guests, like I said, that have been on my tours at this uh, uh, apartment above the British pub that have had the same thing happen to them. What it is is when I take them there, I don't tell them the history. I don't tell them the complete stories. You know, I kind of might make light of everything and tell them what they can do. And they go through the apartment with their K2 meters and some of the other equipment and they'll do their investigations, and I will provide them with the name. However, uh, some of them have come out uh, crying or screaming or running. They said they have felt like something has pulled their hair, uh, touched them. They'll get cold, tingly feelings, and even hot flashes and burning across the chest. Well, when they say burning across the chest, I know exactly what has happened to them. 
So in that case, I will bring them out where I'm at, and uh, depending on who it may be, male or female, and uh, have them show me the area. And usually, it will be scratches of some sort, and not lightly. The scratches are pretty, pretty good. We've also caught shadow figures in there. Uh, and other odds and ends. Again, uh, I want to reiterate, we get a lot of voice phenomena in there. Um, I've had uh, a one one young lady, I will say, uh, she had, she, there was three sisters, and they were in their mid-70s, and the one young lady had a, uh, I don't know what you call it, it's like a watch, it monitors your heart, blood pressure, and all that stuff, how many feet you walk, and all that stuff, and it wasn't voice activated. And uh, she was a non-believer, and as soon as we walked in, her little watch, whatever you want to call it, immediately came up and said, paranormal activity. And she said, what in the world is this thing doing? <clears throat> so I had mentioned to her, I said, is it voice activated or anything like that? And she said, no, it, it, it's not. Plus, we didn't mention anything about paranormal investigations whatsoever. We had just walked into the apartment. And right after that, it started listing below paranormal movies, which we thought was kind of funny. About 10 minutes later, one of the other ladies on my tour had walked to the back, and she was back there, oh, I guess about five, six minutes, not long. She come walking out very, very quickly, and I said, what's the matter? She said, I need to get out of here. As I went outside with her to, to check on her, she said, my chest is burning. It feels like somebody's touched me and I'm on fire. Once again, I knew something had happened. So I said, Do you, is it in a situation where you could, could show me part of your upper chest? You know, she said, sure, this is where it's burning it. And as she pulled her collar down, there was three raised scratches. And, uh, that ha happens pretty common uh, on my tour in this particular apartment. The gentleman who passed away there, would you, and this is just opinion, w would you guess that his passing, his heart attack, was somewhat influenced by the activity in that building? Uh, well... That I couldn't say. I don't know uh, because I don't have that much knowledge about Mike. However, I will tell you another story. And this happened just uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, I will just mention his name is Rick, a uh, very good friend of mine. And uh, we worked together with Ghost Augustine. And he also worked with me um, actually doing paranormal investigations. He started doing this particular tour, the Ever, Not, Ever Dark Express, uh, with me. And he'd only been doing it just, oh, I guess, about 30 days or so. I had informed him uh, to be very cautious about the apartment because um, I, I, I do and did believe, I did believe, I should say, and do believe now, that there was a, uh, I hate the word to use the word demonic, but sinister entity up there and that he needed to be cautious because he used to laugh at me because uh, I would never go past the threshold of the front door per se or just inside the front door. But when I told him some of the things that had happened to me, uh, I wanted him to be aware of it. Well, on this particular night, he was doing the tour and uh, he had a young lady on his tour along with some other folks. And the young lady had went into the back bedroom area and uh, she was taking selfies. As she was taking selfies, there was some kind of uh, figure that appeared behind her. Uh, and I still have that, that picture myself uh, that looked sinister. Well, when Rick seen it, the young lady showed it to him. Rick went back there to the back and started to antagonizing him. Well, Rick had called me up 
and uh, was talking to him, and I met him out at the lighthouse grounds, and he was fairly shaken. He had showed me what the young lady had got, and he let me listen to the recording uh, off the SP-7, which is a, a radio box, per se, and he had recorded it digitally. And he said, Ed, I want you to listen to this. And with this deep, dark, sinister voice, it told him three times, uh, and I'm going to be polite about this, you're dead. Now, I did leave out a word, but, you know, it's not uh, appropriate <laughs> to mention it. But anyhow, uh, it, it did say three times he was dead. Rick said, Ed, what do I need to do? Uh, this, I'm really shaken up about this. I said, Rick, I told you, I forewarned you. You need to go back to the apartment, and you need to, uh, hopefully the, the, the entity is there, and you need to apologize the best you can, tell him that you were very sorry, blah, blah, blah. Well, Rick thought I was kind of crazy about it, but he was upset. And I said, listen, crazy it may sound, I told you, the instances that I've had happen to me, you need to go back and apologize because this is nothing to play with. He told you three times you were dead. Every time he has scratched anybody, it's always been with three scratches. That's not a good deal. So Rick said, well, Ed, will you go with me? No, oh, no, no. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to go. I will follow you back. I will stay in the parking lot while you go back upstairs and talk and apologize. Well, after about, I want to say, 40, 45 minutes, um, I got Rick to calm down, and we were laughing. And I said, Rick, you need to go back. And he said, nah, I'm not going to worry about it. It's probably nothing. Three days later, and there's a long story to it, but three days later, Rick is dead. He died of a heart attack in his sleep. So, with that said, that led me to believe, you know, there's some truth because I heard, I heard uh, the entity where Rick recorded it. I've also have the picture of the young lady that did the selfie. Also, I was told by one of the managers shortly after that, or that was in uh, the end of July, August 3rd, I believe, is when he passed. Uh, one of the managers told me that they had got a call in January, and I want to say it was 2017, where a young man was on Rick's tour that same particular night, who had been an investigator going around the countryside investigating ghosts and things like that, had called one of the managers at our, our company and said, hey, listen, I was on Rick's tour that night, and I just had a chance to go over all of his documentation, EVPs, videos, and such. And he said, listen, um, I got an EVP that night where there's an entity up there that really does not like Rick. So he said, I'm calling you folks just to let you know, if Rick happens to be working for you guys, that he needs to be very cautious about going up there to the apartment. Well, the manager had to respond to him and said, I'm sorry, you're about six months too late. Rick passed shortly after that. So that gave us a little validation that there was somebody else on the tour that was actually investigating that had got something as well. So that was one of the worst things that I've had happen, and I contributed to the entity. It doesn't get any more real than that. It makes you also wonder, this was a case that you just referred to of someone you knew, of, of, a, of a very uh, very close to you experience. It makes you wonder, though, about how many others may have had something similar happen that can be attributed back to that building, back to that specific haunting that, uh, that we're unaware of, and that, that the in individuals involved may be unaware of as well. No, I was going to say, well, this is very true. As far as uh, something that extreme where it caused death, I don't know. Uh, I really, truly do feel, believe, or feel that 
that it had a lot to do with Rick's uh, passing. Uh, a lot of people on my tour, I know, uh, had a lot to say uh, because sometimes, again, I don't I don't tell anybody beforehand when we go in, go up there because you know it would ruin the story and, and anything. Plus, I don't want to plant anything in anybody's mind. You know what I mean? I consider my tour uh, one of the best because our company um, uh, focuses on. Um, no theatrics whatsoever. It either happens or it don't. And uh, I'm a firm believer in that because I don't want to badmouth anybody, but there are people out there that, you know, kind of exaggerate, sensationalizes uh, for whatever reasons. And our company is not one of them, especially me. So, so when I have people that come in there, to include psychics and, and uh, um, what do you call them, psychics and... Uh, Mediums, thank you. Uh, yeah, sometimes when they come on my tour, they don't tell me they're, they're psychics or mediums. Uh, they're there just for the fun of it and things like that. And as we start up the stairs or even go into the apartment, they'll stop and turn around and say, I'm not going in. And, of course, I'll make a joke about it. You know, why not? And a lot of times they will point their finger in my face and say, you know why, Mr. Ed. There's something in here. That's not right. And they, a lot of times, refuse to go in and won't. Other people I will have go in uh, before I forewarn them. Um, you know, the only thing I say is y you need to have respect for the other side because you never know. Just, you know, and that's part of my spill. And I know I've had people that, you know, will antagonize the spirit world. And if I should hear that, I, uh, I will bring it to their attention that, you know, we shouldn't do that. But for the, most of the folks that have been on my tour that have been scratched or slapped, uh, I will say I, I think half of them have antagonized them to bring something out. The other half, I think it was strictly innocent that uh, the entity there just uh, didn't care for them for whatever reason. I, I don't know the answer to that. The, the last thing I had was just a couple of weeks ago. This is the first time that I know of a, I think she was a 13-year-old girl. Her uh, mother and her daughter was on my tour. I want to say about three weeks ago, we got an email on it, Jonas did. And again, uh, when I do the tours, I don't tell too much about anything when we go into it. I, I want the folks to experience it, you know what I'm saying? Let them do it on their own. But anyhow, the 13-year-old the girl had apparently come out. She never mentioned anything to me, but she had told her mom that her back was burning. And her mom uh, was a non-believer, and she just thought that it, she might have scratched herself or a mosquito bite or whatever, because we do also outside investigations as well. But she said after the tour, or during the tour, she had been complaining to her mother the whole time. When they went to Taco Bell after the fact, once again, her daughter had brought it up that her back was burning. So her mother uh, apparently had taken her into the bathroom, raised her top, and looked at her back. And they had, she had sent us the pictures of it, two different shots at two different angles. There were three scratches down the little girl's back. That is the first time that I've had anybody that young uh, scratched. Now, of course, can I validate that? I No, I can't because they didn't bring it to my attention at the time. And some people do, some people don't. Uh, so therefore, I really can't validate it, but I do believe them to some degree because of all my past history uh, with people being scratched or slapped in the apartment. Do you have any inkling as to what this entity is, who it is, why it's there? Yeah, I, I don't. I don't really know, to be honest with you. I don't know why or how, uh, and, and it's just occasionally that he'll come through. And a lot of times when he is there, I can feel uh, the heaviness in the air. Uh, and I'm not saying that I'm sensitive or psychic or anything like that, but I do, um, I do have a gift to some degree of uh, feeling and sensing sometimes. When I walk in there and I feel that it's very heavy or the air is thick, 
I know his presence is there. And a lot of times I will uh, cut the tours short uh, to get people out of there. Because if I don't feel comfortable, I don't want anybody else uh, feeling uncomfortable or getting hurt. You know what I mean? Correct. You had mentioned that there are other entities there, entities that are, are not of the negative sort. Do you have any reason to believe or any evidence or any experiences that would point you uh, into the assumption that maybe they're interacting? Uh, maybe they're they're just as upset by the negative entity that is there, but they still have to share a space and cross paths with it? I know sometimes... Uh when I'm uh, trying to communicate with the other side, again, using the tools and the toys that we have per se, uh, sometimes if, if the entity is there, they're, they seem to be more reluctant as coming out like this entity is holding them back for some reason, or they may be afraid of it. Again, I know it sounds crazy, but that's just me. That's what I feel and I get from them trying to communicate. For me, what happens when I do the tours, um, again, the Everdark Express, is that uh, the, the place is either going to be nothing, very little, or it'll be off the chart. That's that's how I explain it to people. That's just about the way it is. Uh, it, it, it's, it's different. But uh, that's that's the that's the only place that I feel the most uncomfortable is with. But again, like I said, uh, doing my tours, I, I don't tell too many people about it. I give them a little history of the building and things like that. The owners, uh, the people that manage the place, what their um, stories are that they have, and keep it pretty mellow. And then after the fact, uh, depending on. When people come out, they tell me what they've they've experienced and everything, or they were able to talk uh, to possibly the little girl named Sarah or Mike or whomever. Or, you know, and I'll explain some of the things that have happened. And, you know, some of well, you know, by God, I felt something back there, but I wasn't sure, you know, or I felt like my hair was pulled. Again, uh, I let it then tell me after the fact, because I don't want to put anything in anybody's mind. And it's, it's pretty interesting. And then again, there's other times, well, we didn't have nothing happen, you know, and I said, well, I understand, you know, you can't, you can't make the ghost or the spirits come out on command, you know what I mean? A type of location that I've always wondered about being haunted, and I would almost assume it would be a hotbed for hauntings, is an antique store. You have to think of all the objects that, that go to and from the shelves of an antique store, Objects that were, were very important to someone in their life. It survived decades in a home, didn't get tossed away. If your objects made it to an antique store, it was probably something fairly important to you. I would have to assume there's a lot of energy in ac antique stores, and I know that there's one of them there that, uh, that you've done some investigating with. Antiques, Uniques, and Collectibles. It's on uh, Avley Street, 7 Avley Street, um, Denise and Larry, uh, own the business there. Uh, but we take them in there and they also do, uh, as far as our company, we also do a complete para para force. We call it where you can go in and spend the night in the apartment if you want. And Avley street, the antique store. Uh, I take folks in there. Uh, it was the very, very first city jail that we know of in St. Augustine. And over the years, of course, they closed it down, turned it into a laundry facility and other novelty shops over the years. Then uh, Denise and Larry came up, I believe, from Deerfield, Florida. Um, I don't know, about five, five and a half years ago. I'm not too good on the time. And they purchased the business and they run it as a, a classic antique store. Uh, and they allow us to go in there in the evenings and uh, do, again, a scaled down investigation where they will do a complete paranormal investigation again where you can go in about 11 30 12 30 a night and stay till i guess pretty close to dawn but uh we go in there and there's several spirits that i deal with on a regular basis um and they're called henry who is uh from the island of haiti um a young boy named tim 
um, and another young lady named Elizabeth is well known. Now I have a couple other ones that that uh, frequent me in there quite a bit, but those are the three main ones I will say for the most part that uh, stay in that uh, um, store. And of course we've had lots of things. You know we have the flashlights turning on and off for us, uh, usually within command. I always tell people when you're talking to Elizabeth or Henry or Tim, uh, you know, of course, I use the LED flashlights to ask a question and wait about 10 seconds to see if they'll respond with the flashlights, K2 meters and such. And then they're pretty good about it. Uh, most of the spirits in the antique shop there are, are very friendly. Uh, I have not run into anything that was uh, sinister in there. I only had one episode where I had a young lady come in, and she was from uh, Puerto Rico. I, I remember people's names and places if I have something extraordinary happen. And this young lady had mentioned uh, something demonic, which I really said, no, we can't do that. But by the time that happened, the ceiling fan came on, and there were several books that flew off the shelf. I, I shouldn't say flew off, you know, like three feet out or anything like that. But they seemed to be pushed off the shelf, and they were heavy books. And that was the only thing that I had that was a little nerve-wracking to me uh, out of about the four and a half years I've been doing it there at the antique shop. Other than that, all the spirits have been very, uh, very cordial, friendly, I should say, and sometimes just like to play games with us. Uh, Denise has had, uh, again, she has the shop as well as uh, cameras throughout the place. And there's been many times where she has actually set a coffee cup on the desk, a star phone tall coffee cup, and walked away. Now, she has this on video. And as she has walked away to the back room, you'll see the coffee cup like it's pushed over. I mean, completely over off the desk. Also, she's uh, set her purse, or not her purse, but her wallet and keys on the desk and has actually walked to the back. And you will see, it looks like they're being pushed right off the desk onto the floor. So the spirits in the antique shop there are very friendly, but they like to play games, you know. Do the spirits in the antique store, are they resident to the building are they are they from the actual land or do you think they come with some of the objects in the store itself you know i'm going to say a little bit of both possibly uh as far as we know the spirits there uh that we've been dealing with for all these years i think they 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 come with the shop that's my personal opinion not I, I can't say 100 percent for sure but they've been there for quite some time and again, uh, Denise and Larry doing a lot of investigating. That's how we've got their names to include when we go in there uh, to do a small scale investigation. We pick up these same names uh, repetitively. So we know that they're there pretty much on a regular basis. Now, there are times when I will actually go in and investigate and we will have new spirits come through. And uh, again, sounds crazy. But they're just passing through, they're just visiting, or whatever. And they may only come through um, one night, maybe a couple of nights, and they'll be gone. I've also had a lot of, uh, a lot of folks come on my tour. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not saying that, because uh, I'm not a medium or a fortune teller, but sometimes I do sense things. Uh, I've had people on my tour come in there, and as we're talking, or I should say I allow them to do the, all the talking, it's their tour, I will feel or sense something different. And uh, when they're trying to talk, I can tell it, it it's not the regulars. It won't be Elizabeth, Henry, or Tim, or from whomever. And I will ask them, uh, I feel that it's somebody close to you guys. And then there's a, a thing I do by question and error, a question and answer, I should say. And then I will ask them if they've had a loved one 
cross over in the last, say, two years or so. And most of the time they do. And that's when I know, uh, when I sense things, that's what I, I, I can sense. But, you know, I can't come out and say, hey, did you have somebody just <laughs> pass away a couple of years ago? But but I'll, I'll ask them and they'll say yes. And then I'll ask them to give me a name or give me the name of that person and let them ask if that person is here with them. And if the equipment should start going off, then what I do as I say now, I believe this could be your aunt, uncle, mother, father, whomever it may be. Again, but we need to really validate it. So what I do again is um, I'll have them ask a question that maybe only that person and their mother, I'm just going to use their mother, for example, if it was their mother that crossed over. Only they would know, like a, you know, a certain saying or a, a word and they'll say you know to, to try to validate things and if it comes back with a response of a, a positive response then I say okay now this could be so then I'll go through things we'll be talking a little bit and I'll ask him to do it two more times asking a question a different question but only that they and their mother or the past one would know and again, if it comes back a positive, then I say, you know, this is pretty good chance that this could be your mother or your loved one. So as we're talking, uh, it's, it's pretty interesting and people get excited. A lot of people get very emotional and I, you know, it's understandable. Uh, and depending on how strong the entity is or the spirit that's coming through, it's kind of embarrassing for me because I feel that presence and I will become very emotional uh, with them, you know, to include, I hate to say this, but I will even break down and cry because I can feel the emotions so strong from the other side that they're trying to get through and, and give a message to some degree. And I've had that happen on many of my tours over the years. Well, I think that's, it's a very natural human reaction to have especially if you're uh, an empathic person and, and are really able to connect and, and feel uh, what others are, are going through right right so uh then after the session because the session can last anywhere from you know when the when the spirit world comes through for me you know there's no predetermination how of time um sometimes they will come on come through for 30 seconds and sometimes they may come through for you know, I've had them as long as three hours. You, you just never know. But on my tours, I'm only limited to a few minutes uh, at each particular place when I'm doing my tours. Uh, after the fact, you know, I say, now, you know, without planning anything, do you feel like this was one of your loved ones? And they'll say, well, yes, for the most part. And that makes me feel good because then I feel like I have validated it. There are some times when and I don't know. And I said, well, I understand that, too. But at the same time, um, they're able to get some closure sometimes. You know what I mean? So, and, and that makes me feel pretty good, and, and the folks as well. Would you say that some of the, the spirits you say that, that seem to come and go, there's some that seem to be fairly resident, and there's some that seem to kind of show up and then go away. Do you think some of those that are going away are, are going home? with folks who are purchasing some of the items at the store? Oh, yeah, I, I, uh, I do believe that. Uh, for an example, Denise had told me that, uh, told me one of the stories where uh, a young man had came in and bought a, a particular figurine. And I don't know what the price was anyhow, but the guy had bought it, he took it home. And, uh, I don't know the period of time, a few days, a week, whatever it was. I, I, I'm not too sure on the time. He had brought it back to Denise and said, here, listen, he said, I, I want to bring this figurine back to you. I don't want it anymore. Well, she offered him, um, you know, a, a, a refund. And he said, no, he didn't want his money back. He just didn't want the little doll or the figurine in his home anymore. And when she asked why, he said, well, <laughs> 
I bought this thing, and when I put it up on a shelf or a particular place, and I come home or I wake up, it's in a different place in the house each time. And it kind of freaked him out, so he said he, he no longer wanted it in his home, so he brought it back and gave it back to Denise there at the shop. So that's some of the things. Also, uh, there was a story when we first got there. Uh, Denise was at the cash register having her back towards the customer. Uh, for whatever reason, I don't know if she was ringing up the sales or, or whatever she might be doing. But the young man was going to buy a card of some type. Well, as Denise is either ringing it up or doing whatever she's doing and her back is towards the young man, on the video, you can actually see the Coca-Cola machine door opening uh, fairly wide. You can see the guy looking at it, and there's nobody opening this machine. And, of course, Denise can't see it because her back's towards the machine and this <laughs> this young man. And then the, the door closes on the, the Coke machine. Well, the young man just dropped his money on the on the counter, took the card, and walked on out, never saying a word. So those are some of the things that we've had happen there at uh, Antiques and Uniques. Uh, we, we've also got a lot of EVPs, orbs, and uh, some apparitions have taken place there quite often. It is an extremely haunted place. Also, uh, there's part of the um, building, which is a... A closet area, we'll say. Uh, it was built on after the fact, um, and I, I can't tell you the year it was built on, but it's, it's a little closet hallway. And that's where we take people down. Um, I believe, along with some other folks, we believe that is a, a portal area for whatever reason in that area where spirits seem to come through fairly easy as well. If anyone's ever been to St. Augustine or has, has seen any uh, imagery about it, the lighthouse is is one of the more famous landmarks of St. Augustine and also one of the more famous haunted locations in St. Augustine. Can you talk about that? Considered supposedly one of the most hauntedest uh, properties in St. John's County is the lighthouse itself. Uh, again, uh, I take a lot of folks out there with Ghost Augustine, and and uh, we do investigations. A lot of times, um, I will actually, on, on my tours, I will actually bring out uh, some of the extra toys. Depending on the situation and everything, uh, and I know what kind of tour I'm going to have, I will bring a lot of the equipment that, uh, that we sell at Ghost Augustine it's, itself. Uh, with me and it, and it gives a variety for my tours where people are able to use you know the rim pod the vibration the spirit pods and stuff like that or the the new music box that we got uh coming out along with the k2 meters and things like that uh so that's an area that that will investigate now they talk about um there are children pirates and other uh the spirits that do come around the the property of the lighthouse uh, in particular they always talk about Mary and Eliza uh, to the girls that had perished out there uh, me particularly I will tell the stories of the lighthouse and things like that but I've never had those particular girls that uh, drowned in an accident out there come through for me other people say they have, but I haven't. But I have had, I do have a little girl named Amy. Uh, don't know anything about her, where she came from, for the most part. But she has come through for me many, many times. Uh, I also had a young boy named Ben. Uh, and I know, again, this sounds kind of silly. But this 17-year-old Spaniard boy from, from Spain, uh, from around the 1700s, like I said, would used to come through for me quite a bit. Uh, and I would talk to him, and, and I would even go out there on my own sometimes to talk to him. And then he also started coming through the apartment uh, for me. And uh, I have him on digital voice recorder many times uh, talking to me. Uh, 
and, and, and saying things like, uh, you know, for example, even with Amy, uh, when, when I met her, what happened was I was taking pictures and I caught an apparition of a little girl uh, under one of the trees. And I, I perceived that she might have been Mary or Eliza. So when I was calling out their name uh, and trying to talk to them, I wouldn't get a real good response. Well, then I said, well, is, if, the, if this is not Mary and Eliza, who is this? And I got a response that her name was Amy. Now, again, I have that on digital voice recorder. But again, to, to tell you where she came from, how I, I don't have a whole lot of history about her. I just know that she likes the lighthouse and the park area. It leads to, to something that I, I talk about quite a bit where we naturally, and I think it's just really conditioning, and when people think about ghosts over the last uh, 20, 30 years, has uh, helped them go to the light, helped them move on to their better place. And, and I think in some cases, they're in their better place. They are at their happy spot. There's no other place where they want to move on to. And I would say it's probably the case for, for several of the, the entities there. Well, right, right, absolutely. I, I do believe that. I do believe that spirits come to where they feel comfortable and, and things like that. But uh, uh, so, yeah, I, I really do. But uh, again, uh, I don't want to. I don't know how to say this, but we have a lot of activity here, uh, and and it's sporadic. Like uh, again, when I do my Ever Dark Express tour, you know, each tour. Each night is going to be different. There are nights when, uh, or certain tours, like I might pull three tours a night, and I'll start at 6.30, 9.15, and 11.45. Um, I might have something happen at the first tour, nothing at the middle one and the last one. Or I might not have anything happen at all all night. Or, you know, it just varies. You know, you know what I mean? Being Florida, being that we're talking about a lighthouse, and obviously Florida gets its fair share of weather, uh, in, in a fairly uh, quick basis, a fairly quick turnover from sunny day to stormy day. Does weather ever play a part in in the paranormal investigations you've conducted or a part in bringing out the dead? Okay. Here's the thing about weather. People ask me that all the time. My experience, my experience, uh, I feel like if I have a cloudy night, I will have more activity. And doing some of the research on my own and trying to figure out if there's any truth to this or what, again, I don't know. I think if I have a lot of cloud area, if we have a lot of cloud area, I do have more activity. And I think it's because the clouds hold the energy closer to the earth, just as if um, it holds the heat closer to the earth after a sunny night. You know what I'm saying? Uh, if I have a clear night, you know, I may have some activity, but it's not going to be as much as it would if I have a cloudy night. Uh, now, to me, with a full moon, half moon, quarter moon, whatever, rainy nights, stormy nights, it makes no difference to me. It, uh, that, that has no effect on my tours or my investigations whatsoever. Uh, some people say if it's a stormy lightning night, we get more activity. That has not been true in my cases or anything like that. It's either going to happen or it's not. Uh, I've been by running water and things like that. Once again, other people say they've had a lot of activity. To me, it just doesn't seem to make any difference. Also, with the equipment we have, uh, like Jonas, our, our uh, manager or our owner of the company, uh, he's come out with some new equipment. Uh, we have the music box, uh, a PMB vibration device, and a new uh, spirit pod. It is kind of similar to the rim pod and we're always trying to come up with some new toys to see if it helps uh even with the, the new equipment it works really great it really does but again uh depending on the night it uh, you know it has rainy night stormy night makes no difference it's either going to work or it's not explain to me what the music box is it's a it's a little music box and it has a um, a laser beam to it. And what happens is uh, y y you set it up on a table or wherever you want it to be, 
And if anything should block or break the beam, the music box will start to play. It's just a different little uh, gizmo toy that's that's interesting, but it plays uh, a tune. Therefore, uh, let's say like the rim pod or anything else that we have, if you have it in the back room and the rim pod goes off, well, it could be the rim pod or it coincidentally could be somebody's cell phone or something else, you know. Uh, with the music box, it is a distinct m- music tune that it's going to play. So you know without a doubt when you hear that music play, it, it's not a record, it's not a tape player, it's nothing else. It is that music box. So it's just a, an, another toy to use. And, and, and again, it's used by breaking a laser beam. Once that beam is broke, that's what sets off the music box. Since uh, your group that you're involved with, Ghost Augustine, very involved with uh, with equipment uh, and, and ghost hunting equipment, let's talk about that for, for a moment. Where do you see ghost hunting equipment, the technology of it, 10, 15 years from now? I mean, it's shocking where it's at today uh, as to where it was just 10, 15 years prior. But what do you see down the road? Tony, I, I have to say, I, I don't know. I, I could not give you an honest answer there. Um, I, don't, I don't know. One of the things really quick, uh, uh, the K2 meter, you know, that's the most... Uh, well-known uh, item out there yep. and it was mostly used for emfs you know for uh, uh electricity for electricians to check electricity or eddy currents and things like that sure uh the real the real quick story behind that you know they were going to do away with that that was going to become an obsolete item uh but coincidentally jonas the owner of the company uh when he was going to order him the, comp- uh, the, the manufacturing said, no, they're going to cease to exist. We're not going to make them because um, they're not in that big a demand anymore. Well, he was using them for ghost uh, testing, and he said, oh, my God, what am I going to do? Well, one of the other guys that uh, was a professor uh, in engineering worked for Jonas part-time is doing ghost. So they actually took the meters out and actually tested them and tried to validate it, and he tried to get somebody else involved. And that's when he also must met the folks from Ghost Hunters when they came down here, uh, either 2006, 2007. He met up with them at the, the lighthouse, and he gave them to them to use and things like that. And, and the rest is history. So for Jonas to be able to do that, he actually saved... Uh, the K2 meter because it would have been done away with and he was able to work with the manufacturing he purchased a lot of them to show that there was a demand for them Uh, again it worked out and the rest is history now the K2 meter is one of the most uh, used items out there for for ghost hunting a special thank you to my guest today Ed Downing for his insight into the ghosts of St. Augustine If you'd like to learn more about Ghost Augustine, you can visit their website at ghostaugustine.com. That wraps up today's episode of The Grave Talks. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you for downloading. We greatly appreciate it. Please be sure to press subscribe on the podcast and let your friends know that we exist. Give us some reviews as well on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download podcasts. That's how people find out about the show, and that's what helps it grow. Greatly appreciate your help in that. Until next time, for the Grave Talks, I'm Tony Bruschi. Thanks for listening.